Before you watch this video, don't forget to like and subscribe to Social Media Management TV and do not forget to press the notification button and to get more information. Hello everyone, nice to be back with the latest testing news and with me, Vanessa. Cambodian students design drone with hope of fight fires and traffic jams. A group of Cambodian students designed a prototype drone with hope to eventually be used to ferry people around Phnom Penh and even help fight fires. With eight propellers and using a school chair for the pilot seat, the drone was developed by students at the National Polytechnic Institute of Cambodia. The drone, which its development team has dubbed the NPIC Human Carrier Drone, is currently at an early stage of development and testing. Equipped with four batteries, the prototype drone can carry a pilot weighing up to 60 kgs and fly as high as 4 meters and for about 10 minutes. We wanted to solve some problems for our society by making a taxi drone and invent drones for firefighters. The prototype drone has taken around $20,000 and three years to build and the students estimate its needs at least two more years before it's completely ready and fully tested. Sarin Serivata, Head of Research and Development Technology at NPIC says the school is currently trying to secure more investment for the project and that the COVID-19 pandemic has significantly delayed development and testing. Once the prototype is finished, however, the school hopes that it can be applied to practical usage in everyday life. According to the Serivata, the school still plans to build a firefighting drone prototype, a project which may cost up to $40,000. The team is also making improvements to the design and functions of the original carrier drone, such as adding more propellers. Indonesia's future prosperity is threatened by prolonged COVID-19 schools closure. Expert says a pandemic-induced economic shock and closing of schools for more than a year has been devastating blow for many of Indonesia's 68 million students. I almost dropped out of school because of economic problems. My parents didn't work. My mother and father didn't work. And I had time selling tissues at traffic lights. Then I was taken to this foundation to be helped so that I could go to school again. My grandmother has always been trying to support me to go to school until the sixth grade, even though she doesn't have enough. I want to reach high school at least, but my grandmother did not have the money to send me to high school. According to the World Bank data, that Indonesia schools were closed for 55 weeks to August 4, compared to with 25 weeks in Vietnam, 37 weeks in Japan, and 57 weeks in the Philippines. Many schools remain closed in Indonesia with the remainder open for limited hours. With schools shut, Indonesia developed an emergency simplified curriculum and set up online lessons along with the internet credits to help families defray the cost of distance learning. Educational TV and radio programs augment the distance learning. A researcher at the Jakarta-based Esmeru Institute says access to online lesson was plagued by patchy connectivity. Many families only had one basic smartphone often needed by a parent for work. Tresnatri says the learning deficit was concerning for elementary school students and future prosperity of Indonesia. It threatens to undermine Indonesian President Joko Widodo's plans to create a top 5 global economy by 2045, driven by skilled workforce. The World Bank says, before the pandemic and despite going to school for more than 12 years, the average Indonesian student had effective learning for only 7.8 years. That fell to 6.9 years by July this year, according to the bank's most optimistic modeling. 
Indonesia Education Ministry acknowledged school closures had a great impact on children's learning results. Duterte swears anyone who crosses the line in the war on drugs must be held accountable under national law. Head of State. Excellencies, I have the honor to introduce the President of the Republic. Philippines President Rodrigo Duterte says that anyone found to have acted beyond bounds in his campaign against illegal drugs will be held accountable under national laws while appearing to reject an international crime court probe. Duterte tells the United Nations General Assembly he had instructed the Philippines Justice Department and police to review the conduct of the campaign in which more than 6,100 suspected drug dealers and users have been killed since he took office in June 2016. We will deal with all criminals including terrorists with the full force of our laws. The Filipino people want to live in peace, security in their homes and communities free from harm and danger from the lawless. But achieving this goal has not been without challenges. I share this in no uncertain terms. The law applies to all. I have instructed the Department of Justice and the Philippine National Police to review the conduct of our campaign against illegal drugs. Those found to have acted beyond bounds during operations shall be made accountable before our laws. We have recently finalized the United Nations, our joint program of human rights. This is a model for constructive engagement between a sovereign member state and the United Nations. Meaningful change to be enduring must come from within. The imposition of one's will over another, no matter how noble the intent, has never worked in the past, and it never will be in the future. Duterte made no mention of formal investigation into possible crimes against humanity, which was approved by judges from the International Criminal Court last week, although he appeared to reject outside interference in human rights issues. Duterte's government says it will not cooperate with the ICC or allow any investigators into the Philippines. Duterte and his police chiefs have said the killings were in self-defense, and his government has insisted the ICC has no right to meddle in the country's affairs. Rights groups say Duterte personally incited deadly violence in the drug war, accused police of murdering unarmed suspects on a massive scale, and say the police summarily executed suspects, which the police denied. In February, the Philippine police said they were looking into a government review of the killings after the justice minister made an unprecedented admission to the United Nations of widespread police failures. Thailand monk makes traditional grocery truck donate food during pandemic. A group of Thai monks and volunteers deck out in personal protective equipment, carefully navigate a golf cart, pulling a trailer loaded with bags and fresh vegetables through bumpy roads as they head to a village on the outskirts of Bangkok. Their mission is to donate food and other necessities to vulnerable people whose livelihoods has been hit hard by the pandemic. The truck is fashioned after traditional Thai grocery cart, which often roam the streets selling bags of goods dangling off the sides. The monk's truck hits the streets, making multiple trips, requiring help from about half a dozen monks plus volunteers. Porn Chai estimates the truck reaches hundreds of people each day, potentially thousands in a month. <laughs> As the truck reaches its destination, residents begin to gather, each allowed to select five sacks of produce, such as tomatoes, pumpkins, garlic and chilies, along with other goods like dish soap, rice and eggs. Each week's donation costs at least 50,000 baht or $1,498. A cost initially covered out of the monks' own pockets, but now with word of mouth spreading, people are also sending donations. The monks' initiative comes as Thailand is easing restriction and adjusting measures to revive the economy, but the country is still battling its worst coronavirus outbreak. 
Monk Ponchai says he is not sure yet how long the temple will continue the service, but believes he will know when the time is right to end it. Vietnam's capital Hanoi to ease COVID-19 restrictions this week. The government says Vietnam's capital Hanoi will further ease its coronavirus restrictions from this week with new cases on the decline and the majority of its adult population partially vaccinated. Hanoi was busier last week after authorities removed dozens of checkpoints and allowed restaurants to offer takeaway services. Long lines of people could be seen queuing to buy mooncakes, a traditional dessert usually enjoyed on the eve of the full moon festival. Deputy Chairman of Hanoi's Ruling People's Committee, Luong Duc Tuang, says so far 94% of Hanoi's adult population of 5.75 million has received one shot of COVID-19 vaccine, with the aim of completing second doses by the end of November. Hanoi has escaped the burnt of fierce wave of coronavirus infections in Vietnam since late April, recording less than 50 of the more than 17,000 COVID-19 deaths nationwide and just 4,414 of the country's total of 687,000 cases. Japan should respond to international concerns over nuclear polluted water disposal. A Chinese foreign minister spokesman says Japan should respond to the international concern about its plan for the nuclear polluted water issue in which its allegation of technical feasibility has been severely refuted by its records of irresponsible and unprofessional handling of the incident. In addition to the Republic of Korea, many Pacific Rim countries including China, Russia and Pacific Island countries have expressed similar concerns and doubts over the Japanese government's unilateral decision to discharge nuclear contaminated water from Fukushima into the ocean. Spokesman Zhao Lijian makes the remarks at the press briefing while asked to comment on a debate between representatives of the Republic of Korea and Japan at the 65th annual regular session of the International Atomic Energy Agency General Conference. Japan says its ocean discharge plan was technically feasible after the Republic of Korea site criticized it for making unilateral decision without consulting neighboring countries during the conference. Zhao notes that the worries and doubts of Japan's unilateral decision are shared by multiple countries which need to be answered and resolved. The spokesman urged Japan to assume its own responsibilities and take practical actions to solve the issue properly. U.S. Secretary of State meets with the Japan Foreign Minister and South Korea hoping for progress to ending the dispute. United States Secretary of State Antony Blinken meets his counterparts from Japan and South Korea on the sidelines of the United Nations General Assembly. South Korean Foreign Minister Chung eo yong says he will meet his Japanese counterpart and hoped for progress to end a dispute that has led to tit for threat trade restrictions. Chung says he will hold a bilateral meeting with Japan's Toshimitsu Motegi in New York after taking part in a trilateral meeting together with the United States Secretary of State Antony Blinken. A historic feud over Japan's 1910-1945 occupation of Korea, including over comfort women, Japan's euphemism for mostly Korean women forced to work in its wartime brothels, has long sourced bilateral ties between the two important United States allies. The dispute in recent years has brought tit for tat export curbs and threatened a security cooperation between the neighbors despite the shared threat they face from North Korea. Chung says Seoul believed the issues could be resolved through dialogue. The two diplomats also met on the sidelines of the G7 meeting in Britain in May, but did not manage back then to narrow their differences. China's Vice Premier urges efforts to eradicate the COVID-19 cluster outbreak.
Chinese Vice Premier Sun Chunlan stresses efforts to carry out epidemic prevention measures to curb cluster outbreaks while inspecting East China's Fujian province. Sun, also a member of the Political Bureau of the Communist Party of China's Central Committee, visits Fujian Xiamen, Putian, Guangzhou, and Jiangsu cities, which are all experiencing local transmitted COVID-19 infections. Sun underscored the importance of nucleic acid testing for prime groups, contact tracing, quarantine, community lockdowns, and the disinfection of key sites. The transmission of the virus in communities has been virtually cut off, Sun says, noting that it's crucial time for Fujian to control the outbreaks. She asks relevant authorities to strictly implement quarantine measures for personnel crossing the border, adding that the length of quarantine should be determined scientifically. Soon notes, local governments should learn a lesson from recent cluster cases and improve their prevention and control measures, especially for key sites, including factories and schools. China says Australia should be accused of human rights violations atrocities committed by soldiers in Afghanistan. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman Zhao Lizian at a regular press briefing in Beijing says Australia should be accused of human rights violations including atrocities committed by its soldiers in Afghanistan. Australian offshore detention centers, a large number of refugees and migrants, have been long hauled with chronic mental and physical sufferings, and unnatural deaths occur from time to time. Outsourced to private security firms, the detention centers have bad living conditions, the Australian government fails to effectively monitor them, and gravely violates the human rights of refugees and migrants. Historically, Australia committed genocide against the Aboriginals and inflicted permanent pain on the stolen generation by taking 100,000 Aboriginal children by force from their families. During the war in Afghanistan, Australian troops brutally killed prisoners of war and even civilians by shooting or cutting their throats between 2012 and 2013. My colleagues and I have shed light on and condemned the atrocity of the Australian troops many times. The truth has come to light, but justice is still not upheld. These Australian troops remain at large despite their grave war crimes. Afghan lives also matters. The Australian side owes the world an explanation. During the 48th session of the United Nations Human Rights Council, Australia's grave violation of human rights drew wide criticism. China has supplied 1.2 billion doses of COVID-19 vaccine to other countries to combat the global pandemic. Foreign Ministry spokesman Zhao Lizian says China has accumulatively provided 1.2 billion doses of COVID-19 vaccines and stock solution to more than 100 countries and international organizations in the ongoing global fight against the highly contagious disease. So far, China has provided 1.2 billion doses of COVID-19 vaccines and stock solution to more than 100 countries and international organizations, and has given anti-pandemic supplies to more than 150 countries and international organizations. We have also actively supported UN agencies in playing their due role in the fight against the pandemic. This is a strong testimony to China's friendly and profound friendship with other countries in the world and through reflection of China and other countries standing together in times of difficulty. The relevant countries and organizations say the vaccines and anti-pandemic supplies extended by China are like timely rain that has played a positive and important role in fighting the epidemic and protecting people's health. At the general debate of the 76th United Nations General Assembly, President Xi Jinping pointed out that to make vaccines a global public good and ensure the accessibility and affordability of developing countries, it is imperative to ensure equitable and reasonable distribution of vaccines around the world. China will strive to provide 2.0 billion doses of vaccines to other countries throughout the year. On top of the 100 million US dollars donated to the COVAX program, China will donate another 100 million doses of vaccines to developing countries within this year.
As long as the COVID-19 pandemic continues, China will not stop its international cooperation in the fight against it, and the country's efforts and contribution will continue. We will do our best to promote equitable access to vaccines in developing countries. We also call on other countries with the capacity to take concrete actions as soon as possible to support and help developing countries obtain vaccines and necessary supplies so as to contribute to an early victory over the pandemic and economic recovery for the world. And that's all for today. Stay safe, stay healthy and have a great weekdays ahead. See you soon.